Hi students, welcome to HSC Chemistry and Applying Chemical Ideas. This is video number 14 and this time we're going to be looking at mass spectroscopy. As with all our other techniques that we're applying to the um, business of identifying organic compounds, we are going to see if we can use mass spectroscopy to give us some information about our, uh, the identity of different types of organic compounds. This is basically how mass spectroscopy works and once again I'm not sure how much detail you're going to need to look at here but let's let's just give a quick overview and, and see if we can then uh, look at an output and start to, to pick the bits and pieces out of it. So what we need to do is we need to work on the, like we did with uh, NMR, we need to work on the fact that charged particles uh, create magnetic fields and uh, as they move and those magnetic fields can interact with other um, magnetic fields in order to experience different forces. Now we also have a relationship therefore where we can identify the force that acts on a charge moving through a magnetic field. It's a, it's a beautiful little uh, equation, uh, uh, particularly for those located anywhere near the city uh, around the Queen Victoria building. And basically this relationship, this mathematical relationship, uh, tells us that if we have a charged particle and it's moving at a certain velocity through an external magnetic field, it will experience a force. And because we also know that force is equal to mass times acceleration, and I'm sorry to dive off into physics for a while, um, therefore we know that the um, acceleration of a particular particle is going to be influenced by its mass that is it'll experience a greater acceleration if it has, has a lower mass assuming that the force uh, is the same so this is basically the mathematical principle upon which mass spectroscopy works what we need to do is we need to have particles that are charged first of all so molecules we know are uh, electrically neutral so therefore what we have to do is we have to basically um, hit them with uh, something that's going to give them a little bit of a charge if we fire protons into the nucleus or electrons into the um, space around the nucleus we can perhaps uh, charge this particular particle and electrons of course are a better choice because they have so little mass they're not going to influence the um, overall mass of the substance too much um, but what we're going to do is we're going to create a charged particle that charged particle is going to then be accelerated so it'll move relatively quickly uh, through an electromagnet now that external electromagnet is going to exert a force and just as if we throw an object gravity is going to force it to um, back to earth but it doesn't make it drop instantaneously what it does is it follows a curved path before it hits the ground likewise the um, particles that we're looking at in our mass spectra are also going to be following a curved path and of course if they are uh, lighter particles they'll experience greater acceleration and therefore they'll fall uh, fall if you like to call it that more quickly um, and that's why if we've got some sort of a detection apparatus we can get a sense of the mass of the particles in fact what we look at is the relationship between Q uh, and M which is charge to mass and you can see the equations that I've written above just very simply if we can put those two together we do get a um, we can get a bit of a sense of what's happening uh, in terms of the charge to mass ratio this is kind of the principle charged particles will experience a force in a magnetic field you can use the palm rule to actually identify how they're experiencing that force um, and because the size of the force uh, is constant if the charge is the same that means that the um, acceleration is going to be directly proportional to the mass and it means that we can start to look at um, getting some output data on different masses that come through one of the important things that we do need to briefly touch on is an idea around fragmentation 
because sometimes with particularly long molecules, when they're undergoing this process in order to have their mass measured, parts of them can break off. So if we look at probably one of the simplest examples of this, uh, say we were trying to uh, find the mass spectra for ethane, it would be really nice if we could charge up this little ethane molecule so that it was then accelerated, uh, put through a magnetic field which would bend its path and then we could identify it and we would say, okay, there's 12 um, twos as there's two carbons and there's six uh, ones, which is hydrogen. So we would expect to have a mass of around about 30 um, atomic mass units as this comes scooting through. And that would give us the um, data, assuming there were no isotopes of hydrogen other than hydrogen one, no isotopes of carbon other than carbon 12, and also uh, no, the electron that's creating the charge is not contributed to the mass in any way. And also that the, frag that the whole of the molecule remained intact all the way along. So what we would see is just one beautiful, nice peak at 30 and nothing else. In reality, this does not happen. It doesn't happen for several reasons. One, because isotopes do exist and therefore there may well be um, a, a little mini peak on 31, for example, where a carbon 13 may be present or even a hydrogen 2. <coughs> but the other thing that can happen is that this molecule can fragment. And if it fragments, that means it basically snaps somewhere. Um, and the simplest place for it to snap is right down the center. And if it's snapped right in the center, then we now have two fragments, both of which have one carbon with a mass of 12 and three hydrogens with a mass of one. So 12 plus three ones is 15. So that would mean instead of having a peak at 30, we would have a, a lower peak at 30 and another peak here at 15 where some of the molecules have traveled through the mass spec intact and to come out the other end with their full 30 atomic mass units intact, whereas others would have been split in half. And so you'd only have um, littler fragments, which would be deflected more because they'd experience greater acceleration. And therefore um, we'd have a peak at 15 as well. So this is one of the reasons when we're looking at the output data from mass spectroscopy, we, we notice that there is going to be a maximum value. That maximum value is going to tell us the molar mass of the molecule. If there are no isotopes, it will tell you exactly what the identity is perhaps. Um, but again, you still need other data to look at that um, because this is just giving you information about masses. What's nice is if we get fragment data as well, and we start to know that, for example, a CH3 group has a mass of 15, then either we can look for peaks at 15, or we can even look at um, fragments that are 15 less than the total mass of the uh, molecule, intact molecule, to know that a CH3 group has been cracked off it at some point. So let's have a look at the output data in a bit of detail. As we've looked at for previous examples, ethanol is a nice molecule to choose because it's got a couple of different things happening along it. You can see that there is an intact molecule with uh, two carbons, six hydrogens, and also one oxygen. So this is going to give us a peak around 46. Now, we would go a lot more specific if we were to go through our calculations. Um, but in actual fact, what we find is that it's just as easy to um, round these off to give you uh, to help you just to identify where some of these fragments might be. So the whole molecule would have a mass of 46. And you can see that the highest peak there is actually a peak of 46. Now, you can, interestingly enough, see a peak at 45. Now 45 has only lost uh, a mass of one and a mass of one is a hydrogen. So you can see the first of the little molecules that we have on the side here is a molecule that is basically ethanol without that hydrogen attached to the oxygen. So that one less 46 minus one is 45. So that means it must have lost uh, hydrogen. There must be a, have been a hydrogen that fragmented off it. 
So the next big peak we see is this peak at 31. So let's take our molecule and subtract 31. And what we get is 15. Now you might remember from the previous slide, 15 is what we get from a methyl group, a CH3 group. So that indicates that somewhere along this fragment, we've had a CH3 group break off it. Now it could be at either or both ends. It's not telling us how many there are at this point in time. It's just telling us that, that when this particular molecule fragments, one of the fragments that can be uh, ripped off it is a C H3 group. Now that leaves us with our 31. So we can also look at what is the nature of the 31. And again, because we know we're looking at ethanol, we know that what's happened is that the rest of that molecule, so a CH2OH, uh, remains after fragmentation. So you can see we've got 12 for the carbon, 16 for the oxygen and three hydrogens and this is what's going to give us our uh, mass of 31. So this is the value of mass spectroscopy data. Usually what it'll give us is um, first and foremost is we'll be looking for the molar mass. So the high value will be the molar mass of the compound and that's obviously very important data for us. We know that there's a number of things that, that exist as uh, isomers of different types of compounds. And so even if we can identify exactly the carbons, the oxygens and the hydrogens, for example, that are present, we may not necessarily know exactly where they are. But then this idea of fragmentation does allow us to um, look for where the molecule may have been broken, where fragments may um, originate from. And so you can see that there are some values that are present on this output and some values that are not. And specifically for those larger peaks, they are giving us a really good indication of, the, um, of where those fragments are uh, coming from. And therefore, they can help us to, like a jigsaw puzzle, put the molecule back together stick all these fragments back together and recreate that uh, original molecule. And that's what's fun about mass spectroscopy data. So again, you want to have a little bit of a look at a few examples, look at the outputs and see if you can at least start to identify some of those interesting little fragments that uh, have broken off the molecule. Have fun and thanks for watching.